Okay, and we are live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast. Welcome to the Eat Well, Move Well radio show. Ollie Ollerton, welcome to my show. Thank you for joining me all the way from, uh, from the United Kingdom. Thanks, Mark. Uh, well, I was called you Mark then. That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, Damien. It's it's absolute pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, it's uh, the the power of Zoom. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's a pleasure. It's a long time coming. I think we've been trying to arrange this for a couple of weeks, haven't we? So we finally got here. So uh, pleasure to be on, Joe. Oh, it just amazes me the power of the internet. And we we're just talking about Mark Wales before, which another uh, one lined up. That's why I called you Mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the power of visualization. And we'll talk about that because you and I have got a lot in common there. But look, yeah. um, uh, it's, it's really exciting to have you on the show. And um, interesting because, you know, we've got the same background, but I've really got to know you through the TV stardom. Um, which is yeah. a bit that twists your head a little bit. <laughs> um, and then it, it does was my mate every day. <laughs> yeah. and, and then the books. So yeah. I wanted to, I know you've been on a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, different um, shows. I wanted to go down a different route and try and, and get this out there for everybody to help them because I see you being in the service of others. I see your intent is there to, to help other people. So I guess that's where we're, we're looking for. Um, I suggest you're using your training experiences to help others. Would that be a correct mm. thing to say? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think, I think a lot of the time um, when we, you've got to understand that when we start to think of our lives as being in the service of others, now that can be a whole, across a whole range of, of different skills. Near enough, every job is in the service of others. So really, I think it's, should feel it should be innate that we should feel good that we're actually doing that you know that's i think that's a natural you know like primal trait within us to help mankind um advance you know those around us we help to pull up so you know i think that that for me is something that i learned way down the track it wasn't until i was about four in my 40s um till i got a, a real grasp on that and it, and it changed my life and it it was something for me I mean we know what it's like with the earning potential in the military I mean you know I came out of the military and and one of the one of the biggest things on my mind was earning money some decent money you know and I did earn that decent money but it's almost like I'd put money in the driving seat of everything you know it, it didn't matter what I was going to do as soon as I came out I just wanted money and that for me I don't regret it, but it sent me straight back to a war zone, you know, which wasn't good for me. It wasn't it wasn't a great thing for me personally. But, you know, I, I look at it now and say it's it's fool's gold because I wouldn't go back there for any kind of money anymore. Um, but it, was, it wasn't until later on that I stumbled across something that was absolutely phenomenal. And that was rescuing those kids from from Thailand, from Southeast Asia um, and then understanding the power of helping others. And that for me was the, was the experience that would, that would create the backbone for my company Breakpoint. And Breakpoint, you know, our mission statement is to create a globally identified brand recognized for the positive growth and development of others. So really that then became the forefront or as it says, my mission and the money then became a byproduct and that itself created such a difference such a difference because all the time all the way through my life until that point money was in the driving seat and i was i was money's bitch you know what i mean when you're not in control when you're not in the driving seat it creates a very very bad energy yeah i agree and you said a really interesting point there um i think you said innate or built in us it's that altruism um we are lucky enough in our former roles we get that flow state. We've experienced flow state because we've done dangerous things. We expose ourselves to dangerous things. That's one of the triggers. Um, creativity is another trigger, um, but altruism is a main trigger. And I would suggest if that's a, um, a trigger that kicks off all these amazing chemicals in our brains that can make us essentially superhuman for that little bit, then it's got to be something ingrained in us that helping others, or being in the service of others, is something good to do. But I'm the same. It, it, it tended to happen all my comprehension of it was in my later years as well. Yeah, no, it's a hundred. I mean, the, a good sort of um, confirmation of that for me was basically, you know, we, we've been hit hard 
as as every front facing business has been hit hard, um, you know, with the lockdowns and everything else. And while we were in lockdown, I was still doing a lot of virtuals, you know, I was doing virtuals a few times a week, um, which kept the business going. But I started falling out of love with the business. Oh, wow. And it wasn't until uh, just before Christmas 2021 that we managed to put a couple of, of events on that were actually backdated from 2019. We did the events and um, and then afterwards, we then, as we'd done previously, we started getting all that feedback all the testimonials, everyone writing in saying how amazing it was. And the point is, we 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 that's the that's the bit that we'd lost over lockdown. Yeah, we hadn't had that, and then that reignited the passion for what we did. And it was that whole um, it was that passion that then reignited re reignited breakpoints. So we've we've done a full circle, and now we're back on form, and and we understand that power of community, that power of um, you know, helping others. Like I said, the, 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 the return on investment is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, when I went over to Southeast Asia, I talk about that a lot because it was a turning point for me and I had no idea what that was going to bring me. Um, but, you know, I didn't, there was no finance for the first time ever. I was doing something where there was no financial reward. I wasn't doing it for money. I was doing it because I wanted to help these kids. And that is the best investment I've ever made uh, because that is that has been the gift that's that's kept on giving. It's it's just it wasn't an amazing experience. And another thing with that as well, I'm kind of deviating away, which you you'll get to understand yeah. a lot on this uh, talk, uh, Damien, is is the fact that it made me realise that you know I've no regrets doing my SF stuff. I'm very honoured to have been one of one of the few that has passed selection, as I'm sure that uh, resonates with with yourself. But I kind of feel that. That was my life when I was diverting off to find this experience. You know, as a young lad, you are sort of, you have to sort of test the water with a load of different things and understand what fits your purpose. And for me, I thought it was the military, you know, and I pushed and pushed and got into SF and blah, 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 and all that. But just because I'd done that, it kind of set my bearing towards doing that stuff for the rest of my life. And I was fighting again against what my true purpose was. You know, I thought my true purpose had to be this external fix of going to war zones, you know, going to Iraq, going to, to wherever it was. I thought, well, that's you, that's your box. Don't step outside of it. Yeah. And I realized all the all along, I was actually fighting against my true purpose. You know, you've got to sort of let go of the past and, and start to find your own direction after you, after you leave. Uh, SF and not think that you're defined by your past experience and, and achievements. Well, that's perfect segue. And and I love organically getting to know someone. We hit record pretty quick because we don't want to lose that yeah. gold. Um, and and I've I've um, on, done this on purpose for the listeners. I haven't gone into the big um, uh, introduction of, you know, SAS Australia and all this other stuff. I've, I've done it a certain way. So my next question for you is, why do you do what you do now? And then I'm going to go into how you describe yourself. Yeah, really, for me, it was, again, going back to that experience, which really put on the track of helping other people. Yeah. Um, now, when I was when I did that experience, I was actually living in Australia, um, which is quite funny that I've ended up back there. I never, never expected that one. Um, but I was. After that experience, I was I was searching for what was my true purpose. Yeah. And. I obviously established, as I've mentioned, that it was in the service of others. Um, and then I started thinking about, um, you know, because I, I was, when I came back from Australia, the, the, the operation sort of, it fell apart. It caused an international incident. There was all sorts going on. We had to escape out of Thailand. Um, and it was the first time where I'd actually found something that really, I felt at home. I felt like I'd, I'd actually found something that made me feel so humble to be a part of. And that it thing was, for the list, for the listeners, Ollie, that yeah. thing is rescuing children from sex traffickers. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. In Southeast Asia, I was part of an organization called the Grey Man, yep. which was uh, actually run by an ex um, uh, Australian commando. Um, so basically going into Southeast Asia, going to the camps where the kids are being held and they're almost recruited 
um, by the cartels to go to the fishing villages, the, the, the brothels and everything else. And it was our job to basically go in, intercept them before the cartels got there or after they got there um, and then get the kids away, process them and then get them to an orphanage. Wow. And it was it was absolute heaven. Absolutely doing that was I, I thought this is it. I found my true purpose in life. Like when I was in the military, I didn't know what that word meant. Purpose. I had no idea. You know, it didn't mean anything to me. It was like, um, but uh, all the time I was in SF, I was like, I never felt settled. I never, never, I had a great time. It was amazing, but I never felt settled. And really for me, um, you know, I'd, I'd stumbled across my purpose by helping these kids. And then all of a sudden it fell down. I ended up back in Australia. I hit the self-destruct button, which was never pretty. Um, yeah. And you know what it's like for us guys, it's like extremes, everything's an extreme. So if, if I'm going to drink, I'm going to drink the hardest there is. I'm going to, you know, and it was just a, a path of self-destruction in this, you know, it's almost like felt like a victim. And, uh, you know, it was, it was then that um, I started thinking about suicide because I just felt like I was a, a real, um, I, th I felt like I was a burden. And I felt it would be so much easier not being here. Now, listen, I always say this, that I don't know if I'd have ever done that. I never attempted it. But the fact that you're feeling that way, you've already gone too far. You need to do something about it. And that was, for me, and why I mention it is because it was a wake-up call for me. It was like, I knew in my head, and I, I, you know, I heard in my head, it doesn't end like this, Ollie. It does not end this way. And that, for me, really started to create this... Um, wanting to have this, um, to open up to what else was out there. I started looking over, over my past experiences. And I remember, you know, I wanted to recreate that feeling of helping other people. So that's when I came up with the idea of Breakpoint. You know, and Breakpoint, we can go into the, the ethos of Breakpoint, what that really means. But basically, it's just stepping into the short-term discomfort for long-term gain. Um, but really... Um, it was then I set my sort of bearing towards achieving that. And, um, you know, I thought, this is me. This is, I just, I just, I just visualized that having that business, being that person that was helping other people and how rewarding that would feel to do that. Um, so, and that, that's really where I set the wheels in motion. You know, there's a massive process going behind that as well, that I don't think I would have really initiated if it wasn't for the fact I was at my lowest step. It takes that to, you, you talked about finding true purpose. You talked about hitting the self-destruct button, but I think it takes seeing the low of the low to, for you to realize maybe this is a different direction I got to go. I know what you mean about extremes because once you hit that button, yeah, yeah we've, we've, we've hit that, hit that, um, that clacker so many times it, it yeah. just it's crazy that we do it but we just we just do it don't we yeah i think i think it's i mean you, you mentioned before damien about you know getting into that flow step state you know we are trained to be at ease in chaos mm. you know what i mean and this is you know a lot of people talk why and i, I understand it took me 10 years before I re really started to get some balance, you know, it was absolute mayhem when I left because I still feel that I was still looking for that chaos. Right. And I created that chaos, you know, in my relationships, everything was chaos, absolute chaos. Unfortunately, I didn't have the tight fitting wetsuit of the SBS to keep me in check. You know what I mean? So really it was, it was mayhem. You know, I didn't have someone tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Hey, mate, you're out. You know, there was no one there. I was, I was my own barometer. And um, I was out of control. But that is, I, I just believe that that is because why, you know, it's, I call it as well, peace in war, you know, highly trained soldiers like ourselves, you know, you are trained to be at peace in war. That's why when you come home, your missus is going on about the washing machine broken down, that someone's parked across the drive. It's white noise. And you just can't wait to get back to a war zone where it's black and white. You know, exactly, you know, it's, that's your peace in war. I hope that what you said resonates and I try and translate it that when the guest says something as well, um, I hope that resonates with someone there that we might be actually looking for that chaos. We might be recreated in our brains. And I worked a lot with um, my former unit psych, which was, was so great because she speaks the language. Actually yeah. interesting story, Ollie. Um, uh, they actually got kidnapped, I think in Syria, her and a, another female offsider. 
hundred people want to cut their heads off, and um, she talked them out of it. <laughs> Whoa! Wow! Yeah, what so she speaks their language, you know. Wow, that's amazing. Um, but what she was saying was um, synapses and the way the brain's wired, and we, we're mm. wired to that. There's, as you say, highly trained. That's what we're used to, to doing is chaos. Maybe that's what we go looking for. And we recreate that. It just comes back to that visualization. You visualize yeah. some another pathway out and you and you dug yourself out of that hole. Yeah. And that's why the business is called Breakpoint, because we are as humans wired. The, the reason yeah, we're wired um, to, uh, to fall into these repeat habit loops. We are addicted to repetition. And that goes back to our primal instinct of, um, you know, a, a basically our minds want us to do what we did yesterday and the day before and the day before that, because as far as our mind is concerned, when it's linked to our survival, it's kept us alive until today. Yeah. It doesn't give a shit if it's a good situation, bad situation. It just wants to keep repeating that habit loop. But when that really is becomes apparent or becomes significant, when you want to make any kind of changes in your life, whatever it is, want to get rid of any kind of negative habits that's why you hit so many blocks so many obstacles and before you know it you flung back into that repeat habit loop of absolutely nothing you know for me a lot of that was drinking i was drinking heavily um and i would just lose days and days and days it was just just ridiculous and i got to a certain point and i went there's no more this is no more i could see the error of my ways the pattern that i created uh, and that for me is when I, I did lock myself away and I wanted to understand how the brain's wired, but we are addicted to repetition, you know, yeah. and we are the product of everything we've been doing yesterday and the day before. And when it comes to breaking out of that, it's tough. You're not going to be inspired. You're not going to be motivated. You're going to hit, you know, so many um, opportunities. Well, not opportunities. You're going to hit so many hurdles that want to send you back to our comfort zone. There's no comfort there whatsoever. Uh, but it's, it's, we're just driven by habit and repetition. That's just human nature. I just realized, I'm, I'm fairly sure that you're the, your audio book is the reason I reached out um, to, um, I won't mention a name, but to, to the former psych um, that, that selected us. Um, you do psychometric testing um, in Breakpoint, yeah. don't you? Yeah, we use a thing called PRISM, which is yes. actually was actually created by an ex, a guy that was 14 in there, the support um, element for a lot of training in Northern Ireland. Yep. He was involved with, with the SAS. Um, Colin Wallace was his name, but he then, bizarre as uh, the, the, the industries and, and professions we find ourselves in as lads, yeah. um, he went off to be a neuroscientist, scientist, neuroscientist, and then created PRISM. So I was attracted to him because of that in itself, but you know, there's very few psychometric uh, or character assessment tools that are actually based on neuroscience. Mm. A lot of the ones that are out there are created. And if they're not neuroscience, they're basically someone's opinion. Yeah. So the one we use is neuroscience and that really then is tailored to the individual. But for me, when I actually, when I, before I was trained in that, uh, I'm now a practitioner and it's, it's across every uh, facet of our business. Brilliant. You know, I took the test and then it was given to me afterwards and I was like, ah, no, nah, the machine's broken. <laughs> and they <laughs> laughed and said, it's not broken. You know, but the thing is, I'd been so, you know, I'd, be, I'd created this persona through because of the world that I found myself in, you know, and it really, when I looked at the report, it, it told me exactly who I was outside of that facade. And once uh, I think that's such a strong thing to to, to really understand you know, the true character of who you are, not not the face you put on that's determined by, you know, the people around you or the, the uh, you know, the, the profession you've been in. It's really important to understand that. And then you can really start to work with your strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, that that was the, um, the tipping point for me was realizing that psychometric testing got me into the SF and showed me what I, who I was. And I'm in a mm. very different place now, which you and I talked about and you alluded to at the start, of where you're at um and why not re psychometric test yourself to possibly find your true purpose as well in that case i'd like to just talk about what someone um what your typical person coming on to break point is and what's your role how would you describe yourself now because you know a couple of years into the sbs you were an sbs operator but how would you describe yourself now yeah, I mean, I don't like to call myself a motivational speaker because 
it, it just doesn't create the right um, kind of image. But really, you know, I mean, my job is to help as many people as possible. And right. that is my passion. That is my Love true it. passion. Um, so really what Breakpoint does is we looked, you know, if, if it was a simple, you know, if, if someone said to me, what did Breakpoint do? We changed the way people think. You know, the majority of people get through this life and die not even knowing who they were. You know what I mean? And that comes down to the fact, you know, uh, schooling, you know, our environment, everything. But people don't sit down and actually start to really understand who they are. Um, so for me, Breakpoint is about waking people up to who they are. It's about waking people up to their true potential. Um, but you can't understand that until you understand who you are. Um, so really, I mean, our business is changing a lot these days. We're actually doing a lot more stuff online. Um, but um, we we have events generally or have had events in the past. We've got one next week for a big corporate. And we are putting people, the, we use an actual SF platform for that. And the reason we use an SF platform is not to train people to be SF soldiers. You're never going to do that anyway. But one thing it is to do is because the majority of people have never stepped inside that world, a very small percentage. And what we want to do is create an environment where people feel vulnerable. Now, when people feel vulnerable, their ego is gone. That's gone. And once you get that, you can relate to this, Damien. You know, the, the bond that you get with the lads when you've gone through the hard stuff, yeah. there's nothing like it, absolutely nothing like it. And that's because when we train together, when we work together, whatever it is, there is no ego. No. You know, the ego is pushed aside because there's more, something more important to focus on. And exactly. that's making sure as many people stay alive as possible and get the job done. Exactly. Um, so really, we, we create that say, a similar type of environment when people feel vulnerable. And once you get that people's reactions, actions, how they deal with other people become extremely organic, they see a person that they've never seen before, or for a very long time. Um, and when you when you create, I mean, the show typifies that, mm. you know, these people that come on the show, they want, they, you know, they want to be the biggest, baddest, lone survivor stood at the end and then they realize quickly that they can't do it on their own you know it's it's very typical of the environment we come from um and it really helps them to it gives them a real good hard look at who they really are um so, so break point is a similar type of thing especially on our sort of physical events uh we have one absolutely horrendous event <laughs> i'm not selling it very well and that's called denied and that gives people a snapshot into our world in 36 hours what it takes to be an sf soldier the mindset and that's extreme fatigue that's extreme uh hunger um and all that kind of stuff but that releases a different kind of beast the breakthroughs on that event are ph phenomenal yeah and that's a very popular popular event for us which we want to keep on doing so it's uh, but really for us, yeah sorry go on mate it's, it's on. interesting the way you've um I was going to say prison, but the way you've you've looked through it there and described Breakpoint, I'd just like to offer a different view, and it's from one of your audio books, which we'll speak to soon. Yeah. For the listener, um, you spoke uh, in one of them about a female who was a former military person that came along in one of the courses, and I think she, you said that if she'd not got on your course, she probably we would have topped herself. Could you speak yeah. to that just to form a from another side about why that person and what that person would have got out of um at a break point? Yeah, I mean the, the the vision for me, and that this was actually when I was in Australia, the vision for me was actually creating a company where we um focused up um, you know, we focused on the corporates and um we then engaged former veterans to be our our staff. Yep. Um so really for me, you know, when I thought that when, when this was in the days of uh, conception, I realized a lot of my issues when I left. And it was that camaraderie, that community that I took for granted that when you, you know, when you sat behind the wire, you think you're invincible, you think you're going to go out there, smash it. And you don't really, you know, you obviously know the camaraderie is, is like nothing else, but until you've actually experienced not having it, um, you don't truly know what that's about. So I just understood that there was um, a real place for veterans to come and work with us to start to feel that sense of community, to start to feel engaged, to start to have a sense of purpose. We come from a, a real, you know, a mass, you have a massive sense of purpose in the military, especially in the special forces. 
And when you lose that, when you leave, you know, that, that creates a massive void, a, a phenomenal void. And people struggle to find purpose. And that was exactly what happened with the female in question. You know, she came back to Breakpoint. She felt part of that community. Um, she started to have that sense of purpose. And that gave her a zest for life again. You know, and I think it's as simple, that's as simple as it needs to be a lot of the time. A lot of people are actually complicating their, their issues by, you know, they think they've got a drinking problem, they haven't got a drinking problem, there's underlying issues that are causing them to drink. However, you know, a lot of people turn to drink and drugs and all that kind of stuff because they haven't got a sense of purpose. You know, they've come out and then they've lost the direction, they feel worthless and, um, you know, it creates a lot of instability. Um, so, you know, Breakpoint really provides that, you know, for all the staff that work with us, work for us. And they're not, I'd say 90% of them are veterans. You know, it's not predominantly, we're just veterans. Yeah. You know, we have that mix, but, you know, for the stuff we do, you know, our veterans, and we've got a lot of lads, you know, ex the, working in the fire service and stuff like that, that actually work for us. So, um, so yeah, it's really, it's, it's really, and when you, when you do the events, to get the, the lads, to get the team together, it's just that humour that you can't find anywhere else. You know, it's, oh. it's, it's just it's just unreal. That's um that's brilliant explanation of Breakpoint. Um, I'm glad we went down that route, but what I'm really glad about, and it really shines through, um, is you clearly know your identity now. And when I started interviewing veterans more, which, you know, the straight talk mind and muscle show, a lot of it was, professors and, and then um, Olympic coaches. And then it started getting to the, um, the veterans as well. It's really interesting to comprehend transition. At the start, you talked about money. Literally, when we're thinking about getting out of the military, it's what job are you going to do? People don't realize it's what identity you're going to change because you're transitioning a whole, you're taking the body armor off, taking that camaraderie away. It's a whole new identity and it's, um, it's life changing, but you're clear on that. So what I'd like to do for the listener again is now I want to throw your background in. I didn't want to lead with that because I had an inkling of where you're at, which was, was good. But can we run through for the person that, that doesn't know Ali Ellerton, um, mm -hmm. your background from, say, uh, let's go through the, the circus through to where you are now uh, with, with crayons. How long we got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Fair. Enough. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll try and um, compress it as much as possible, Damien, because it is a, a quite a long-winded story. But really, um, my first memory as a kid was 10 years old. I don't have any memory before that because of um, one horrendous experience I had at 10, and that was being, sound, I, I laugh at it now, but I was, I was attacked by a circus chimp. 10 years old, you know, you know, I was sat there with this thing, sat on top of my chest, ripping chunks out of me, thought I was going to die. And it was through those that that sort of moment where I just said, no, this is not going to happen. And I actually reacted and did something, uh, managed to dislodge the chimp, managed to kick it off and get away from it. Um, and it, if it wasn't for the chain around the, the monkey's neck, I wouldn't be here today. Um, and certainly for the actions that I took on that day. But that really... When I, when I look at this, you know, this is great point, the offices. I'm actually having a big chimp actually painted <laughs> on the wall behind me. Wow. Because I feel I owe so much to that chimp. You know, it was like, it taught me what break point is all about. And that's stepping into the short-term discomfort for long-term gain. My short-term discomfort, discomfort was fighting a chimp at 10 years old. The long-term gain was living that day. Yeah. You know, that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be my last break point, but it was certainly my first. And also that taught me something else as a 10 year old kid so close to death, that no matter how bad your situation is, it doesn't matter how bad it is, we all have choices. You have choices and there's always op opportunity in crisis. So that was really the start for me. After that, my life was pretty crazy. I was void of any kind of consequence, got in trouble with the police. I was pushing the bar. I wanted that. It, I, it, I blame the chimp. <laughs> but, you know, it gave me that sense of danger. I wanted to be at death's door, knocking on death's door every day, you know, and I was pushing the envelope big time. I had to be stopped. Um, and I, I was finally stopped and, um, you know, went to court, uh, escaped to custodial sentence uh, for a whole manner of things. Um, and then finally, you know, my mum sort of, um, really put, put a hand down for me to lift me up and really start to focus my energy. 
Um, and that was on my fitness and everything else. 14 years old, I said, All right, that's it, I'm joining the military. And I felt there was nothing else in the world for me. It wasn't like a last resort. It was just like this was stood so proud in my peripheral that, um, you know, it's the obvious choice for me. Well, not, not just peripheral, it was peripheral and the main sort of um, focus looking forward. Yeah. Um, and that was it. I was like, I'm joining the military. I let go of, I, I didn't see the purpose or felt no passion for the, for academia, for school. Um, and um, next thing I found myself joining Royal Marines at 16 years old. I'm sorry, tried at 16, but didn't get in at 16 due to one of, well, I didn't join it at 16 because of my because my um, uh, record, I had a police record at the yep. time. I had to wait till I was 18 so it wouldn't go in my, on my service record. Yep. Uh, 18 years old, joined the Royal Marines and then went to, you know, passed out after 32 weeks of training and then went to Northern Ireland, um, first war, and then went to Iraq after that and came back from there. To be quite honest, mate, I was absolutely disillusioned. It wasn't, it wasn't hitting what I expected. It was so... I felt so disappointed. Um, and it was at that point I said, right, I'm going to leave. Uh, my officer from 4-5 um, Commando, where I was serving, uh, just said, look, I, I do believe you've got what it takes to join SF. If, if you don't do it, you'll regret that for the rest of your life. Yeah. And those words were so powerful. So powerful. You know, someone that um, I really admired, you know, as a mentor of mine, who was my officer. Um, and I had so much self-doubt so much self-doubt lack of confidence but i borrowed confidence off him that day yeah and i borrowed enough confidence to put in my um you know notice to to have a go at special forces selection and um and anyway cut a long story short i managed to achieve that it was it was phenomenal i can remember getting off the bus at hereford on day one 280 other people wanting the same as i wanted and i can honestly remember getting off and thinking i've got off on the wrong stop <laughs> You know, I was, I was 23 years old. I looked, you know, about 10 stone wet, wet through. I looked like a little child. I felt like a boy in a man's world. Yeah. And um, I was about to get back on the coach and a little voice in my head said, just do today. Just do today, mate. There's nothing worth it. Just do today. And, you know, I'd looked around me. I perceived everyone else around me is better than me. Uh, they already look like SF soldiers. And um, I just did today. And I was beating all these people that I perceived were better than me. And that gave me milestones of growth before I knew it. I did the whole nine months just do today. It's um, funny the, um, the, the image you have inside your own little mind's eye, though, isn't it? Yeah, I know. It's, and, and that is, you know, that's your self-doubt. That's, that's when your self-doubt starts to come in. That self-image yeah. is so important. You know, if your self-image is if someone that's, you know, is weak and you know you will actually that's that's what life will deliver you you know what i mean you'll hold yourself back self-image is so important so anyway i started off my sf career there was a hiccup along the way i'm not going to go into because that's another long story but i finally got into uh, into sf and again once i got into sf i was like i felt deflated i don't know it's just like that I, I actually loved selection. I know it sounds bizarre, <laughs> but I love selection. I love being challenged and I love being, you know, not to say that being in SF wasn't challenging. Uh, anyway, I did six years. It took me six years to do anything about it. Um, and I spent six years in SF, 11 years total. Um, and to be honest, then, you know, my career in SF, there wasn't lots going on. There wasn't wars in the Middle East and stuff like that. You know, there wasn't loads going on. And for the purpose I joined, I wanted to be at death's door every day. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't there. You know, there was certain stuff we did and it was great. And it was, you know, it was Gucci and it was all everything that we wanted, you know, we imagined it to be, but there wasn't enough of it. And that's why myself and quite a few other lads left at the same time, you know. And for me at that point, it sounds bizarre, but I wanted more adventure. And when I say that to people after seeing the pictures and stuff like that, they're like, are you mad? I'm like, <laughs> adventure for me is when I can create my own footprints and not follow someone else's. Yeah. And that really, you know, in, in SF, in the military, I can see the world in front of me. You know, you're going to have your different experiences, but, you know, I could see all the people in front of me going up the rank system and they were all moaning. They weren't happy. And I was thinking, why would I want to, why would I want to be there? Well, yeah, I've got nothing to, to aspire to. So I then left and I thought, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to start my own business. I was chasing the dollar. And um, 
said I'd never go back to a war zone, ended back in Iraq, where I ran a, a business with uh, a few other XSF guys. We employed 2,000 Iraqis, um, and basically doing major infrastructure projects. Uh, that was probably the, the hardest or the worst part of my career to date. Um, you know, being in a war zone when you haven't got the support elements, especially from the world we come from, and, um, you know, heavy, heavy drinking, drugs, Valium, all sorts of stuff going on. And it, that cocktail caused mental mayhem. And I left after, after five years of that uh, because I didn't think I'd come back from there. Um, ended up in Australia then. And um, again, never going back to a war zone. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, again, searching for that chaos. You know, sub, it's a subconscious thing as well. You're not like going, oh, I'm, I need some chaos. It's a subconscious drive. You know, the subconscious mind is the driving machine toward everything. So subconsciously, I was looking for that chaos. And then I found out about the Grey Man, Southeast Asia, rescuing the kids from child prostitution, slavery, wanted to do something to help these kids. And I had no idea about the, uh, um, what was waiting for me, you know, and that was a, an epiphany, if you want to call it that. That's the exact. And then that made me realize, sorry, mate, go ahead. That, that's the exact word, the epiphany. That's what we were searching for a few minutes ago. Yeah, no, it, it, it was an absolute epiphany. And, um, you know, that then set me on the path. Although I was still broken at that stage, it set me on the path to create my company, Breakpoint. I finally got back to the UK. Never said I'd never come back to the UK uh, for one or two reasons. Um, but all of a sudden, I dropped the barriers and surrendered to the thought of that. And when I did, everything started flooding in. Everything started coming in. I'd been putting up these barriers for so long. And I had this calling to come back. And I came back. My business was all about helping other people. I actually locked myself in a house for three months where I knew I needed to change the blueprint of who I was. And I needed to you know, get rid of these negative habits that were no longer serving me and start building new positive habits. And that for me was three months of mind, body, nutrition. And I made sure everything that I consumed, both orally and mentally, was of the highest caliber that was in line with my drive for where I wanted to be. Didn't recognize myself, the person I was when I left that house three months later. But every day, mate, I was like, I was doing stuff that I never thought I'd ever do because I had nothing, I had nowhere else to turn. Visualization, meditation, setting goals, all this stuff I was doing, I'd have never, been, I'd have never have done that, I don't think, unless I was forced into a corner where there was no other options. Um, and I engaged in that. And every day I dream about me and Foxy, my mate of uh, SAS Who Dares Wins, uh, the TV show, who I served with as well. And we would be on a stage teaching people, you know, about our experiences and helping them, you know, all these corporate clients on a big stage. Yeah. And I visualize that every day in my meditations, visualize the life I wanted to create and not get bogged down with my circumstances of who I was at that time and not become a victim of my circumstances. Oh, and yeah. I did that every day. Towards the end of that, I started to doubt what I was doing. My family were telling me to go back to a war zone. Oh. And um, I just knew that there was something there. Um, however, that seed of self-doubt was starting to tick, eat away a little bit. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, I get a call from Foxy, who was with the production company, who were looking to start the program SAS Who Wins. And for me, I was like, wow, this is just ridiculous. You know, I've been thinking about this stage that me and Foxy would be on. I didn't know that the biggest stage was about to be delivered and that was the TV. And then we did back to back series of that for six, seven years, uh, which has been absolutely phenomenal. You know, it really put me, you know, it gave me the exposure that has helped me set everything up, create the books and it's really given me a voice. But I do feel I have a duty um, to really use that to the best of my ability to help everyone as much as possible. Um, I'm no longer part of the UK's version of it, but then um, we got the opportunity to start SAS Australia, which has just been next level. It has just been brilliant. So I'm, I'm honored to be a part of that. But for me, TV is a sideshow. It's a sideshow. You know, my passion has always been to start this business and that will always be my passion. Um, the TV brings its own inherent uh, value. And I really do appreciate and I'm humble for that. But my vision, my mission is to create a globally identified brand recognized for the positive growth and development of others. And it's working. Wow, that's brilliant. And 
I urge anybody that's listened uh, to this to uh, read your books. Me, uh, I just I just put the audio books on and do everything I got to do, and and they're life changing. Yeah. They're, they're they're very um, uh, you can't put them down, uh, Ollie. So well well done. I mean, I I Thank think you. we started just yeah. off camera. Um, you know, who would have thought we're out we're we are at where we are now. I mean, an author, a TV star, when, thank you for going through your background, you know, really you were just a, a young kid in a uniform and then you got to be a special forces operator and now yeah. look where, we, where you are. But something was telling there when you said that three months, you know, if you do what you always do, you're always going to get what you always got. You, you clearly had to change that and discarding all the things that weren't pushing you towards that new person, you talked about visualization, all the other things you're doing. Visualization, I said we come back to it, and you touch on the subconscious as well. And you almost did it like probably a lot of other people do. The subconscious mind is the driver. It's not, it's not a little thing just because you can't see it. It literally runs the whole show. Yeah. You're doing visualization, which is amazing. Um, how did you get into that? Yeah, no, that's, that's another, I mean, that three months for me, you know, when I started doing all that kind of stuff, all the visualization and meditation, you know, I'm sat there thinking, as we do, we think there's a thousand person audience sat around us critiquing us, which, you know, contains some of our best mates that are laughing at you saying, what the hell are you doing? Um, and you have to really swallow that. You have to, you, you have to put that, push that to one side. And um, for me, you know, I started looking into the power of, you know, I started to invest my time into some of these inspirational speakers you know for me it was bob proctor um and a, a range of others um i forgot the uh, the other guy that was quite uh, anyway i'll come back to that but you know every day i would listen to them and you know i'd, I'd take their advice and I'd, i just thought you've got nothing to lose you've got to just try it you know and i can remember meditation and visualization you know, I just sat down and it was hard because my head, we have 70,000 to 100,000 thoughts going around our head every day. And in a world that's predominantly negative, we have to start to select the things that we want in life. Otherwise, we end up with a load of stuff that we don't. When we talk about the subconscious mind and goal setting, now, whether you think you choose goals or you don't choose goals, we're driven by goals. Every person on this planet, our subconscious mind is a goal striving goal getting machine that stops at nothing till it gets what your dominant thoughts focus on. That means whether you choose it or not, you're driven to what the dominant language of the mind is. That ship's just going to keep on going, isn't it? That ship's going to go that way. Where that rudder's pointed. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing is a lot of people, when they don't take any positive direction and have any kind of mind management program, they end up in a place that they really don't like. And they go, I can't believe this has happened to me. It's happened to you because you haven't taken any clear direction about where you want to be. And really, a lot of people think, well, I'm not sure what I think about. Take a look at the life around you. That's what you think about. You know what I mean? And that, that is just absolute scientific fact. That is the subconscious mind. We have the frontal cortex, the conscious mind, which is all our thoughts and everything. And the more we, we repeat the thoughts in the conscious mind, that then... Uh, that then gets up, in, or should I say, it impresses upon the subconscious mind. Once it's in the subconscious mind, it can only come out as action. That's a brilliant way of looking at it, Ollie. And I urge anybody that's listening to this to rewind two minutes, listen to that again. It's phenomenally powerful. Look at the life going on around you because that's what you're thinking about. That's a really good way of putting mm. it. You said my management program, I was lucky enough to interview Brandon Webb. Uh, former Navy SEAL, now owns a $100 million media company. He's transitioned from the guy in, oh. with the M4 and, and body armor. He's, he's transitioned yeah. completely into a completely different person. Eric Davis, um, yeah. his partner, they, their job was in the SEALs redesigning their sniper training program hmm. from the wow. old the old yeah. kick in the ass and you know all the harder um military way they went and did all the things you did and they've got a mind management program and um and visualization program and they expect 100 percent on every um every shoot from the snipers so yeah, really wow. telling that you're doing the same thing yeah i think i think really you know the beauty of our backgrounds is 
we can adapt ourselves to anything. But the thing is, you know, the human nature, again, we end up think that we're being shoehorned into and, and labeled as an XSF opera. I mean, Jesus, when I came out, I was thinking in my head, I was like thinking I was an SDV, a, you know, mini sub um, pilot. And, you know, where, where the fuck am I going to fit into this world? <laughs> you know what I mean? But the thing is, you, as soon as you start looking outside of your box and understand that we're humans, we're not meant to be, you know, labeled and shoehorned into a box, we can achieve anything. Any person can achieve exactly what they want. You know, I've, so you must know as well, Damien, it's like some of the lads, you hear what they're doing, you're like, what? But they're doing extremely well at it. You know, some lads go off and be lawyers. I know one, two lads that they were doing security. <laughs> I used to serve with them both and they were doing security out in uh, in Iraq and Afghan. And um, they end, ended up tripping over an opportunity. And cut a long story short, they're now one of the biggest suppliers of building um, electricity pylons. No they're way. Apps, yeah, it's just like ridiculous. And it's a big company, mate. It's like a massive company. They just, they just like tripped over the opportunity. And now they've made millions, absolute millions. So it's, it's just bizarre. But the thing is, it's like anyone, not just ex-military, ex-SF, you should never shoehorn yourself into some little label box that you think you're supposed to not step outside of. You know, we can achieve exactly what we want to. You've got to have a level of passion, of course. But once we start to engage that visualization, start to really load up the subconscious, um, I, I'm always a believer that the opportunities are already there. People have different levels of obstacles in their way just through life's programming from schooling from our parents you know a lot of it everything in life is the five percent structure 95 percent mindset you know what i mean so you know once we start to understand that we can achieve exactly what we want in life it's like it's and again a lot of people oh, mindset and visualization what a load of rubbish da, da, da. once you've got a taste of it once you actually know it works, it is absolutely contagious. It is, it consumes you because you're like, wow, this is amazing. But getting people across the line, and that's what we do at Breakpoint, we get people across the line to start understanding their possibility, the potential of their possibility. So we all comprehend just, that um, through, uh, through whatever um, selections we've gone through, we, we're visualizing what we've gone to, the, um, what we want to achieve. Um, but interesting segue, achieving you know you're you're a acclaimed author now um yeah. I've, I've got this in my, in my i actually did some questions for once for an interview i can't believe i'm an interview interviewer now i mean yeah. i'm a firefighter and a shooter apparently um but mm -hmm. you've let's go through your books because we talked about breakpoint yeah. as a book and as a company um yeah your books are, are brilliant i bet you never thought you'd be an author but what are the titles of your books so that people can can search them out yeah i'm actually uh well the, the two self-development the first one was breakpoint breakpoint is basically laying the foundation of who i am um laying the structure really that gives me the authority as far as i'm concerned to then start to delve into the self-development world. So really Breakpoint was that story from the 10 year old and all the way through to, you know, coming back to the UK um, and having the vision for Breakpoint. Then my second book, and that, that, that first one was the Times bestseller, um, number one Times bestseller. And then the second book, Battle Ready, is basically when I put myself into that house for three months, it's really the process that I put myself through during that time. It's called Battle Ready, not because it relates to war, but it relates to the fact that regardless of who you are, everyone's fighting a battle. Yep. You know, everyone's fighting a battle. And really, we should be fighting a battle every day. And that is to be the best version of who we are. You know, I'm fighting a battle every day. You know, I have good days and bad days. My good days, I'm strict. Like today, I was really strict. Up at five o'clock, meditation. I've got a sauna, so I meditate in the sauna. Once I've done that, I then go out for a run with the dog, come back, cold shower. And then I'm behind my computer um, before, you know, before the phone's going off. WhatsApp's not going off. You know, my emails are not coming through. And I can get an hour's work done, usually before people are actually even getting up. And I can do an hour's work in the morning, which would take me two, three hours to do later on in that day. So really that book really lays out that whole process that I put myself through in um, 2014, 2015. 
And um, it's something that I do to this day. So really, Breakpoint was a story um, of who I am. Battle Ready is a call to action. Yep. And there's exercises through that book where people can start to fill it in and do stuff. And, and, and really, it's for people to follow that process. You know, really, it's a lost opportunity if you're just going to read the book. I can speak from, Ed, from my own experience. I put it on as an audio book because I'll, I'll do a lot of stuff when we're driving. And um, yeah. I'm literally stopping it and writing it down. I'm saying, no, I've got to get the hardcover. <laughs> I, gotta, yeah. I gotta, this is a how-to book. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. The way I talk about it, I, I, do you, are you aware of a Haynes manual? Yeah, of course. You, <laughs> we, yeah. Uh, you're a year younger than me, I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 there you go, mate. So a Haynes manual, for those that don't know, whenever you used to buy a car, you used to get a book. You know what I mean? And that was for you to be able to do a self-diagnosis, should anything go wrong with that car, or to do any kind of maintenance, you could refer to the manual and you could do it, you know, yep. do it yourself. Now, about already for me is that Haynes manual for the soul. You know, that is the Haynes manual for each and each and every individual. We're born into this world as amazing, creative human beings. And then we get a little bit misguided along the way. We go to school, which, as far as I'm concerned, is just a programming center to, to slot you into society to be a good little slave. But really, we start to lose all the real strength of who we are as humans. And really, that is a real understanding of how we're wired and what goes on. See, in this world as well, it's so important, or in this world, let me finish that bit first, everyone's faking perfection. You've only got to look on Egogram and everyone is out there faking perfection. You know what I mean? People aren't prepared to, or, or people aren't geared and wired to really start to focus on their weaknesses. They only want to work on their strengths and, and, and display their strengths. So really, Battle Ready is really taking an honest opinion of where you're at right now. You know, until you know where you are now, how can you expect to, to have a goal to go somewhere else? It's like putting into a GPS. If you can't put your location in at the start, it will never give you a destination and how long it's going to take to get there. You know what I mean? So, so really, Battle Ready is that Haynes manual. It's that owner's manual for the body, for the mind, body and soul. What a brilliant way of putting it. Uh, and you talked about soul, which is, is, is great. Talking, talking about um, seeing your weaknesses thing and other things like that, that, I guess that transitions us into the TV show. Um, and for those in Australia, it's really popular here, um, mainstream. What was popular is, um, you know, you had a lot of celebrities on it. And when I say celebrities, it's not like Beyonce, it's like you had former, um, <laughs> we'll see what happens there. <laughs> you, got, you got some sports people that are of, of high caliber. Um, yeah. You know, you had the the Great Britain um, uh, captain, a rugby league captain at one stage. Sam, is it? Yeah. Um, really interesting breaking those people down. So maybe let's just touch on that because really you, we're seeing that on the screen. Um, it was I saw SS who does wins years ago. The original one didn't know uh, who you were, didn't know who um, uh, Ant was, and and this the Scotsman who's doing his PhD now, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that first one, um, that was Colin. Yeah. And Colin had a, uh, he did the first series with us and then um, he was replaced by yep. Billy. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's, um, no, it, it's, it's been an interesting journey for me because when I first did that, first up, when I got that phone call to do that show, I was like, because I need to understand what the purpose is. You know, with everything in my life, I need to understand what is the purpose of this? Why am I doing it? Why am I investing my time in it? So for me, when I first got that opportunity, I was like, mm, OK, well, this is going to be something for the military fanatics. It's going to, you know, bottom line for me, it was the platform. It was yeah. the platform that I needed for exposure, which you can't, you know, you can't pay for that kind of advertising. Um, so it was, it was that was my purpose at that stage. After the first series, I then saw the power of it. And that was the feedback from that show and the way they did the edit. It wasn't about the military. It was about human psychology. And it was phenomenal. They're just the ripple across, we disrupted 
TV, you know, the normal TV, we were disruptive in that industry. Yeah. And really it created something new, the whole reality sort of TV stuff, when people are pushed to their absolute limits. And that sort of then get me re-engaged, it really gave me a sense of purpose because I saw how it was inspiring so many people. So, you know, that went on for six or so years. We, we started off just doing a, a, a non-celebrity version of that show, which was absolutely brutal. You know, in the early yeah. days, we had no real assets, we had no real money. <laughs> And they got absolutely rinsed. I, I really <laughs> do sympathize. You know, they got absolutely rinsed. And then we started the celebrity version, which a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you shouldn't do celebrity. And then we start before that, we started um, doing a mixed show. So male and female. Yep. You know, there's a lot of kickback. Oh, you should do that and all this. And it's like, I just think it's brilliant that we did that. And the fact that we did the celebrity version as well. I love the celebrity version. The reason for that is, is because when you see these people that are celebrities, we have a perception of who that person is. Yeah. The media also creates a perception of who that person is, which influences what we think about that person. They then come on that show, and as you know, Damien, going through selection delivers a person to you that we didn't know we were. You know, it uncovers so much stuff. It real peels the onion of who yeah. we are a true character and that show demonstrates that but we couldn't do that with a non-celebrity version because people don't know the people from adam uh, that are coming into the show so when you've got a celebrity it shows the transition that we go through on selection and it delivers something else at the end of that yeah you know for those that are fortunate enough to make it through to the end and everyone on that show you know that even the people that don't make it to the end it changes them it absolutely changes them. And that is the process that happens on special forces selection. It changes you massively. And I really think the celebrity one demonstrates that really well. Because again, we have a perception of these people and then all of a sudden we show that this process delivers a better human being at the end of the day. It really does. I mean, the military changes people, selection changes people. I remember our first operation regular military we had a 20 year old male in the mm. platoon come along 21st birthday um at the three month of the tour but i watched that boy turn into a man because of what was happening it was it was so humbling to, yeah. to see but um you talked about being a disruptor for who dares yeah. wins in, in in australia as well just like top gear i mean <laughs> Yeah. What woman would watch a, a show on, on cars, but Jerry Clarkson, Little Hammond and, and Kat, Captain Slow, everybody loves it. Same thing yeah. with you. You know, my, my partner, Jess, you know, she would not want to see any SF stuff. She has yeah. my war stories and, and things, and it's not really for her, but glued to that television because yeah. it, it is encompassing. And I guess it's watching that journey of people from coming in on, uh, on day one to wherever they, they end up at. Yeah, no, for sure. And that, that, I think everyone sat in watching the show, everyone can relate to someone mm. on that show. So something someone's been through or something someone says strikes a nerve with everyone. Everyone sees themselves in that person or as that person. So I think it's really engaging. And we are, we are absolutely compelled to seeing people at their absolute lowest and seeing what happens in that moment. You know, we we have this, some kind of sadistic uh, passion to, to see people really pushed. And, um, and I think that's why that show inspires so many people, because I think, I, I truly believe, humans were born from struggle. You know, and I think a lot of people with society these days, we're just not challenged. And no. people, people desire that challenge. They desire that, that ongoing sort of um, pressure, that you know it's fact that we we perform better under pressure exactly it actually engages the nervous system when we are under pressure that's why a lot of people end up dying as soon as they finish work you know they've been working in some kind of industry for 40 years or whatever they then retire and die two years later yeah you know it all goes downhill but really we 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 thrive under pressure a lot of the times when we do have that level of pressure in our lives the bullshit disappears you know what I mean? It's, it's big picture stuff from there on in. So I think there's that 
real need or that desire to see that. And I think that really sparks something in everyone that watches that show. And again, like you referred to Top Gear there, Damien, at the end of the day, it wasn't about the cars. No. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's about three, three blokes that were really having a crack and having a laugh. And it was that sort of camaraderie and everything else. There was a lot more to it than cars. And exactly. this is the same with the 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 the, the show. You know, it's, it's it's far beyond a military show, far beyond. Oh, you know, and absolutely, and that is compelling. So compelling. Uh, that's perfect because my next question is going to be what's a, what's the dynamics like? Um, I a lot of these questions that I ask you, I'm cracking up because I know the answers. Because unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, you and I are in the same headspace. <laughs> but for the listeners, what's the dynamic like? You got some really interesting cats here. You got. Um, uh, Foxy, who you, you know, you got Ant, you got Billy. Um, yeah, what's the dynamic like in between it? Your yeah, I mean, I like you know. At the end of the day, it's it's no different than when we were serving. You know what I mean? It's no different from what we are now. Just to explain for the listener or the viewer, you know, people seem to think because we're SF that we, you know, at weekends we, you know, when we have got time off, we all hold hands and go to barbecues together. And, and spoon in the evening. Well, some people probably <laughs> do, but <laughs> but really, you know, it's it just. I think it's interesting. You know, we I talk about this a lot with the with the corporates that the bond is amazing, but it doesn't mean you like each other. I know that sounds contradictory, you know, because a lot of the times, you know, you go on missions, you go on operations, even in training, where it doesn't mean you're close to the people around you, as in the friendship close. But there's no greater bond. I think it's because basically if you get shit wrong, then people are going to get killed. And that creates a different kind of, um, you know, a different kind of beast within each person. But really, it's um, our mission. Our mission is the priority. You know, ill, um, Ill feeling and, and differences get left at the door. The dynamic on the show is, you know, again, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but diamonds are created under extreme pressure and that's i think a bit of an analogy for really how it works on the show you know that show being put together is no strict set format we go in basically and we have a template to work with things we want to do and then we shape it from there and it gets heated you know guys have got different opinions let's do it this way let's do it that way but the end result of that is something that's amazing and it works so well. And I do believe if we didn't go into that sort of semi-conflict, if you want to call it that, I don't think we'd end up with the, the quality of show that comes out the back end of that. You know, I think in general, some amazing things are created under stress. When there's no stress and there's no pressure, there's no real need to perform, if you want to call it that. You know, and I think you can gain a lot from having that pressured environment. And that's really how we work together. You know, I get... On great with Foxy. Foxy's like a long-term mate of mine. I didn't serve directly with the other two, but even me and Foxy, you know, we'll have differences of opinion. But the thing is, you know, we'll have those flare-ups or whatever, and it's not, it's never, never brutal at all. But we'll have those flare-ups, and then afterwards, it's like, you know, it's not, it's not daggers in the back. It's yeah. like you just, you, you crack on and get on with it. You know, it's like because you've then come up with something that everyone agrees with. And there's, there's nothing worse than having a team where you've got one person at the front saying, this is how it's going to be done. And everyone else is like, just bahaing like a sheep behind and saying, yeah, you know, just following that dictator, you know, it's, it's, yep. it's you've got to, in any kind of um, high performing team, you've got to have that difference of opinion. You've got to have everyone um, has got to be engaged in, in, in what you're doing hundred percent. You know, you can't have someone that disagree and some don't, you know, and that's really getting to that, but getting to that point just does create some pressured moments for sure. I, I talked with Dan Pronk or Dr. Dan Pronk um, a while back on, oh, on I love the show. Dan. Yeah. <laughs> lovely guy. Wow. Yeah. Again, judging a book by the cover, no, no chance, but, um, and I, I would hesitate. I'd, I'd no, I'd put money on it. He's probably the only regimental doctor that's passed a selection as well. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. He's a great guy. He is. I actually got in touch with Dan a while before the show because I knew we were coming to Australia and I come across Dan Pronk on the in, on um, Instagram. Yeah. And um, I was just trying to tap him up to, to try and get him in the show because, you know, having someone as the doctor on that show who actually knows, you know, the world that we come from is... It's absolutely vital, you know, because people see the doc as some kind of 
you know, the soft touch. Oh, yeah. I'm feeling, you know, oh, I'll, I'll stop blaming some little injury and, and, and <laughs> I'll go to the doc's route. Then the doc will take me off. And yeah, but he doesn't stand for any shit because he's seen it a hundred times before, you know. Oh, just like when we were going through your, your background so um, quickly, that people have got to read your books. Um, go back and listen to the interview with Dan because he's a phenomenal uh, uh, human. Um, but I asked him the question because a unique position. Um, I asked him what sort of caliber of person you're getting out of the end of SS who does wins. He said it's the same sort of thing. And mm -hmm. I'm leading to it was a camaraderie. Those people that are coming on the show and wanting to challenge themselves. And some of them may have only had individual successes. Um, I'll go back to the um, the prior show. You had a uh, Olympics uh, Olympic uh, athlete female, a uh, Yana, I think it was Sam Burgess. Yana Pittman. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and a doctor. I mean, talk about individual mm -hmm. uh, success. And yeah. and the um and the the sprinter. Only only two out of th the three had ever done. Um, Sorry, only one out of the three had ever done team stuff, but they all came to know camaraderie. Those people, their lives were in each other's hands. And yeah. apart from a small amount of people in the world, not many people get to experience that. So that's a great thing that you're putting them through. And I think that's another reason for success of the show. You're seeing people at their at their rawest and 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 looking after each other as well. Yeah, but you know what? I think that relates to um, our world, Damien, where people think that, oh, you know, teamwork and everything must, you know, these guys are the absolute ace at teamwork and all that. And I can't, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I feel as an SF operator, you are more of a leader than you are of a team player. We adapt to, to being within a team and we do that well, but I just believe that it's a group of leaders as opposed to your, your typical team. I, I, you look at the guys when they when you leave. You know, we all go off and do our own individual things. We no longer need to be like joined at the hip with our with our oppos. We all go off and do their own individual things. So I really believe that we are leaders adapting to being within a team, even when we're you know when we're serving. That's that's my sort of take on it, as opposed to being a, a group of team guys that, that you know fall apart when one person we lose one person. We, we're a group of leaders, and I think that's a very unique sort of team ethos to be to be a part of it really is my last ceo jim blackwell i'm saying his name because he's, he's public now he's he used to have the ethos of uh, 80 percent individual training 20 yeah. percent team training um yeah but you know you said sort of 10 minutes back um you may not be best mates you know may, may have some disagreements with each other but we put our lives in other people's hands I trust yeah. my skills going down a rope. I trust my skills with a, a gun in my hand or ex explosives, whatever you're going to do. And I trust the gear. And when I say trust yeah. for people listening, 100%. Mm -hmm. But I trust someone else the same. If, if someone says hold, I'm not moving because they're putting bullets past my head. And I'm fine with that because I trust them with my life and I, I do the same back with them. It's, um, it's a different place to be. And it's what's really cool is you're, you're using those, it's back to the start, using your training and experiences to help others with breakpoint so it's brilliant to see you your success there yeah no I've, i just i just i love what we do because it's you know it's not just a military thing it's really just that you know we don't own this this sort of the ethos behind breakpoint breakpoint is taking care of the little stuff and once you learn to take care of the little stuff in your daily habits and behaviors the big stuff then takes care of itself you know i talked about being bitten by a chimp I wouldn't suggest anyone goes to the circus and finds that experience. But, you know, it's like I'm faced with breakpoints every day. And that's really because we're wired to take the path of least resistance with everything. That, again, is a normal human trait, the way that we're wired. And, you know, that can be as simple as doing the dishes the night before. It's much simpler just to leave it and wait till the morning. But really, you know, it's like stepping into that breakpoint. Just go through the little bit of discomfort when you're tired. Do the dishes you don't have to wake up to a bag of shit in the next day. You know what I mean? And that's just an example of what breakpoints are all about. And they're presented to each and every individual every day. That could be sending an email. It could be like making a phone call. It could be staying an extra hour at the office, an extra hour in the gym, doing that training session when your mind is telling you, and your mind will tell you all the time because it knows it's going to go into a level of stress. It will be, it will, it will be devious and try and distract you from actually 
putting the time in. So really it's about understanding what's going on, know when that's happening and totally contradict what's going on in your head. So all the time, when that happens to me, when I say, right, I'm going to train five times this week and my mind starts going, well, check your computer, check your phone, trying to look for these, yeah. um, these distractions. Um, I know exactly what's going on and I've got to just let go of that emotion and just follow. And that's where I think we really come into our own here is, is discipline. That is void of emotion. You know, don't expect to be 100% motivated every day because you're not going to be. And when you're not, you follow discipline and you follow another thing that we learned in our careers, Damien, is the fact that process process that is void of emotion gets us results you know when i always laugh at this you know you can you imagine if it was like you got your orders before you go on the ground it's like right lads when you get on the ground get off the get off the helicopter if people start shooting at you and it starts getting a bit nasty just jump back on the helicopter we'll call it a day you know what i mean <laughs> you know we know that it's never a straight line to achieve anything you know what I mean? And, and the fact of the matter is, if you got on the ground and then allowed everyone just to deal, just to, to run off their emotions, it'd be an absolute clusterfuck. But the fact is, we follow a process, don't we? A to B to C to D, extraction, get to safety. And that's where I think we come into our own because process and discipline are the only things that get you to achieve your goals. If you're looking for motivations, I don't care if you're an astronaut, a gold medalist, whatever you are, motivation comes and goes it's never consistent absolutely it is um and discipline isn't sh for people other people listening it's just it's not shouting at yourself shouting at others um rah 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 it's, it's just the I actually learned a while back is the art of um being a disciple or art of teaching it's just ours is self-discipline yeah Ollie, I've it's got four. So important. I've got four questions for you, quick fire, and I learned this from someone who interviewed yeah. you. So, um, <laughs> yeah, always learning. Um, just, to, just one word. I'm going to throw out at you, and I just want your your um, your take on it. Um, four of them. First one's purpose. Purpose. We are driven by purpose. We have to have a sense of purpose to understand where we're going in life. And really, I look at it as if you haven't got purpose. You are like a ship without a rudder. The sail might be full, but it's going all over the place. Once you have a sense of purpose, it's like sticking a rudder on that ship and it gives you a clear direction bearing. Happiness. What brings you happiness? The smile on my face every day. You know what I mean? A lot of people I talk about, um, you know, doing well in business and, and really succeeding. That to me is me having a smile on my face and being content and happy. You know, like I said before, obviously, you know, we're all, money does one thing for me and that gives me freedom. And that's freedom to experience other things. But happiness for me is having that, to feel a sense of fulfillment and to know that I'm helping other people. And just that, having that sense of, uh, sense of purpose, I guess, as well. So, yep. That's yeah, that's interesting how that tied back. Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, third one, future for you. I believe that we are continuing, we should be continuously evolving on a daily basis. So for me, um, you know, my mission statement, which is also like really important that people have established what, you know, ask yourself this question, what is my mission? What is my mission? And you need to be, you know, also, you could frame it differently. If mission doesn't relate to you, what is your purpose? Also, what do I really want? What do I really want? If you can't answer that question, you need to start asking yourself some questions. So really, the, the future for me is to keep on doing exactly what I'm doing um, and not get distracted because I'm a very creative person, as I know through my uh, psychometric testing. Um, <laughs> and uh, as soon as things get boring, I want to create something new. So for me, it's just focusing on exactly what I've got and just making it bigger, better and further afield. And last one, um, I, I did say one word, but I've got to give it some context for you to answer it for this show. Advice. W what advice would you have for someone that has been anywhere that you have been? Purpose. We're back yeah. there. Purpose, start to really understand your purpose because you come from a world that is, is, is spoon fed you purpose. 
And now it's really, you know, if you're struggling, if you can't understand where that purpose lies, you've really got to put some work into that. So, and just understand as well that, um, you know, one thing that changed my life is the fact that neuroplasticity, and that means we can change and be exactly who we want to be. You've just got to put your mind in gear and actually believe in yourself to be able to do that. So, um, and then goals, you know, goals are the one thing that my lowest ebb got me out of that deep, deep and dark place. And that for me was casting stone to where I wanted to be and not get bogged down with where I was. The more we focus on anything, the bigger it becomes. So really for me, it was about visualizing where I wanted to be and not being a victim of my circumstances, set goals, and then start to build a process that gets to that goal, keep pushing, keep going. And also the fact that, you know, it's like a fad diet. It's like a, a training program. A lot of people want to stop as soon as they're looking good. You know, <laughs> yeah. the, the thing is, it forget the image. The image is the byproduct of you feeling great. You know, it's all about chasing the feeling. The image is the byproduct. That's a good point. I, I, my visualization stuff, my mind power stuff was through John Kehoe, who actually did mind power. And he talked about, you know, it's really hard to push the car, but once it's going, it's easy to push, but you yeah. have to keep pushing. Otherwise it stops. It's hard to start again. Kind of a different uh, uh, analogy or example of, of what you're saying there. Yeah, no, I like that, mate. Cause it puts it, it's exactly what it is, isn't it? You know, you can't stop pushing that car, you know, and sometimes you've got a hill. Sometimes you can push it down the hill, <laughs> swings and roundabouts. That's a good good point. Ollie, um, you know, for the listeners and the watchers, um, where have they got to go to find you? Let's let's do the links. Yeah, there's um you can find my website, which is ollieolliton.co.uk or dot com, um, or ollie.olliton on Instagram. Uh, just put my name into Google and yeah, you you can't get rid of me. <laughs> Mate, I just want to say thank you, uh, A, for coming on the show and, and B, being so open and, 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 um, and sharing of your, your time and, and your heart, but also a personal thank you from me because as we're talking, I, I really realized that it was your book, Breakpoint, that, um, that started to dig up out of the hole uh, for me personally. I didn't realize I was going down that way, but your, your book and when you spoke about um, the prism, it was that eureka moment hey there's a way out and that got me in touch and starting the journey so again personally from me thank you so much for uh, for doing what you do thank you very much mate that's that's inspiring to me uh, absolutely inspiring to hear that feedback and it's a pleasure being on here mate and um i hope to see you in person oh mate I'll, 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 i will not buy you a whiskey i'll buy you a green smoothie i think because there's no more drinks <laughs> for you <laughs> yeah absolutely but awesome. Thanks. Very thanks. Much, mate. It's been amazing. Nice one. Cheers, Ollie.